We also have some interesting data from psychedelic drug research in the last decade or so. We used to think that these drugs operate by stimulating the brain to hallucinate. And what this new neuroimaging of psychedelic drug trips shows us, that the more elaborate and mystical the psychedelic drug trip is, the less activity there is in the brain. Again, as if the brain is getting out of the way so the mind can expand. Now, this is theory that the brain is not the creator of mind, but the filter of mind. Sort of like um, a radio uh, set will, will receive radio signals from all over the world and filter out all but one station you want to listen to. If you listen to all the stations at once, you wouldn't be, you'd be able to hear any of them. So it filters everything except the one you want to hear. Uh, you know, if you have a cell phone and you're listening to someone's voice on the cell phone, if the cell phone suddenly loses its activity, its battery, you won't be able to hear your friends talking anymore. And yet they're still talking. In the same way, as the brain starts to deteriorate, you no longer can hear what the mind is doing, but the mind is still there. This is not a new idea that the brain is, is a filter of the mind. Uh, Hippocrates, 2,000 years ago, wrote that the, the brain is the interpreter or the messenger of the mind. And this has been reported throughout the centuries by a minority of neuroscientists saying, yeah, the brain is not the creator, it's a filter or receiver of the mind. This should not be surprising to us because the brain is a biological uh, organ that evolved like the rest of our organs did. And most of our organs, sensory organs, evolved to filter as well as to receive. For example, your ears don't hear all the frequencies there are to hear. It filters out those that we don't need and just lets in those that are essential to our survival in the physical world. We know that other animals hear frequencies we don't, but that are not important to us. Likewise, our eyes, eyes see only a small fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum, just that portion that's essential to our physical survival. And the idea is that the brain also evolved as a filter to filter out those thoughts and feelings we have that aren't essential to survival in the physical world and just lets in those thoughts and feelings that are essential to surviving here, finding food, shelter, a mate, and so forth, and filtering out all those irrelevant things like deceased loved ones and gods and so forth. We don't need those to survive in the physical world. So all this suggests that somehow the mind can function when the brain has stopped functioning. If that is true, then is it possible that the mind can continue to survive after the brain has died entirely, after we're dead? There is a lot of evidence for that. And we certainly have, uh, as I mentioned before, NDEs in which we have encounters with the deceased loved ones. Sometimes deceased loved ones who have been dead for a long, long time. What does it mean for you? Um, well, there are some takeaways. The first is that near-death experiences are very common and they're normal. Most studies suggest that NDEs happen to about 5% of the general population. That's one out of 20 people, or about, it would be three people in this audience if you were a normal, uh, or you were an unbiased sample of the population, which of course you're not. Um, but it means that someone in your class or in your workplace or in your family has had a near-death experience. I think another part of this is that they're normal experiences. They're not related to mental illness in any way. They're a normal response to an abnormal situation being close to death. Secondly, I think we need to recognize that near-death experiences have profound after effects that need to be addressed uh, by the experiencer, by their loved ones, by their healthcare workers. These are attitudes, beliefs, values, behavior, I should add that this doesn't necessarily affect their bereavement, their grief, even though they may believe now that they go on after death and their loved ones are in fact in a better place now. That doesn't take away the sadness at no longer being in daily contact with a loved one. So they feel, still feel the same grief that everyone else does, even though they may know cognitively that their loved one is still around in some, some form but they have less fear of death and therefore less fear of living. And they tend to enjoy life more, to find it more meaningful, more fulfilling. I think another important takeaway is that NDE strongly suggests that the mind can function independent of the brain. Again, I can't tell you how that happens. I don't know what the mind is. There are huge problems with the idea that the mind is independent of the brain, but I would argue that there are even bigger problems with the idea that the brain creates the mind. We have no idea how that could happen. 
And if the mind can function independent of the brain, then it is entirely possible that the mind may continue to function after the brain dies, after we're physically dead. And that, I think, opens up a whole range of questions for us.